All right, if you're new to Hope City, I always love to have an anchor verse. So for week one of the parables, I'm anchoring this weekend with John 14, 26. I love this verse. But the advocate, these are Jesus's words, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Come on, let's pray. God, thank you today for the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, convey to us the things that are hidden that you desire to be revealed, that through these parables, as ancient as they may be, we know that they're still relevant right now. And our prayer this weekend is that we will be forever changed and that these words that are spoken through these parables, God, we thank you that we can take these words and recognize that your word has no expiration, that it is as powerful as it it was then as it is right now in real time. So we receive it. We have a mind ready to understand it, ears to hear, and a heart ready to receive. If that's you, shout amen. Amen. All right, let me give you some groundwork as we step into week one of the parable series. I want to lay some groundwork of what this series is all about. If you're a student of the Bible, wave at me if you're a student of the Bible. Okay, nine of you. Okay, we got some work to do. We do. We have a little bit of work to do. A student of the Bible is someone who is pursuing the things of God. To be a Christian, I've said this for a long time, Christianity is not about behavior modification. It's about heart transformation. So as you walk with Jesus, to be a Christian is literally to be Christ-like. Galatians 2 says it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So you got to think about that when you're road raging. Okay. If you're a student of the Bible, you know that Jesus spoke. They, Bible theologians believe there's over 40 different parables that were recorded. Parables all throughout his public ministry here on this earth. So what is a parable? A parable is a story that runs parallel to a deeper spiritual truth. And with profound wisdom and understanding, Jesus would connect these story moments to the human heart, but also something that we could understand and comprehend with our mind. So he would speak in parables to teach us not only spiritual lessons, but also to connect us to earthly lessons. That's what I love about our communicators and what we do here at Hope City. Every single week, whether it's me, Pastor Jackie, Pastor Brandon, or a guest minister, you're going to hear a powerful word. Come on, somebody say amen. And the word of God does not return to him void. So when we preach the word, it is as active as the day it was God breathed. That's good news. You're going to show up every week and you're going to get great worship. Come on, make some noise, Hope City worship. You're going to get a powerful word. And we believe a deposit from the Holy Spirit. So when you leave here, you leave better than when you came in. Come on, y'all believe that? So that you don't have to carry the broken pieces, you can leave with the peace of God. So parables are meant to demystify the supernatural by drawing a parallel with the natural. So that's why I love through our communication, and this is the way I preach, I'm a storyteller preacher. So I love to tell, uh, talk about the word, and then I also like to tie in a story, and that's how the Holy Spirit speaks to me and ultimately through me. And I believe that's part of how God has connected his word to my heart. And I love that Jesus spoke in stories and he spoke in these parables. So for this week, week one, there's no fancy title. Week one of our parable series, this is what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at the parable of the lost sheep. The parable of the lost sheep. Everybody say, I didn't think y'all would do that. I did it. In my notes, I'm like, they're not going to do it, but you did. That was actually amazing. All right, we're going to start in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. I'm reading out of the New Living. It's on the screens. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners. you got to be, you got to be a professional sinner to be a notorious sinner. They often came, now I love this, to listen to Jesus teach. You know, even those caught up, caught up, even those that are caught up, Even those that are caught up in struggles and strongholds, they still recognize the authentic. And I love this. They would often, it says, come to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees, those are the religious people. We don't want to be like them. The Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that Jesus was associating with such sinful people and eating hot pockets with them. That's the way I read it. So Jesus tells this story. This is where the parable jumps in. Watch this, verse four. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Will he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? 
And then verse five, he says, and when he's found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, verse six, he'll call together his friends and post it on social media. His neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. This right here is special. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have not strayed away. Now, real quick, I love this parable. Don't misunderstood the last line, though. There's something to be said of someone who has stayed on mission, who has lived righteous and holy and been a person of character. Come on, give that person a hand. That's good. But Jesus' purpose in teaching this specific parable was ultimately to illustrate God's deep, unfailing, unconditional love, but also showing us that he literally is concerned like a father for every single individual on earth, specifically for those who have slipped away. So I'm going to go back to verse 4 for a minute. If a man who has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness to go search for the one that is lost until he finds it. Point number one, and this is not fancy, it's just the way I think. Sheep aren't cheap. <laughs> Write that one down. Sheep aren't cheap. Take a picture of that if you want. Sheep aren't cheap. Some of you are gonna post that and people are like, what was he talking about? Go back and listen to it on YouTube. Here's the truth. Sheep aren't cheap. Jesus was not only painting a spiritual parallel, but he was also in the natural connecting with those that he was speaking because each sheep had tremendous value to the shepherd. Just like us, Genesis 1, 27 and 28 talks about how we, male and female, were created in the image of God. Y'all, he says you're valuable. He, he, he says you're worth it. Elbow the person next to you and say, I'm not cheap. Come on. Elbow your second choice, say, I'm not Gucci, but I'm godly. Amen. <laughs> Just elbow. <laughs> that was so bad. <laughs> I'm going to do it again next service. Just like every individual is so significant. Listen to me. I don't care how you got here. I was born in an accident, almost aborted twice. And God took a misfit bunch of messy farmer people and breathed life into our family, and it restored my dad, my, my, my mom, everybody got set free and saved, and the domino effect has continued. My brother's in ministry today. I never should have made it, and I'm preaching the gospel all over the world because he values you. He sees you. He chose you. He knows you. Now, maybe others have forgotten about you and forgotten your name, and you look in the mirror, and you're like, I don't even think anybody cares about me. Sheep aren't cheap, and this week's parable shows the shepherd's willingness to leave the 99. He got them all safe and secure, and then he went out to search for the one, and I love how this parable also underscores the immense worth placed on every single soul. My prayer this weekend, this is my prayer. This is my, my prayer and my faith this week is that we would all leave this week recognizing our own worth in God's eyes. Come on, say, close your eyes and just say, I'm worth it. Say, I'm valuable. Even if you don't believe it, I need you to catch this. You're valuable. Jesus pays the ultimate price on the, on the cross. God sends his best gift, his only son, to hang on the cross because he said, you were worth it. Yeah, but Pastor Daniel, you don't know what I've done, where I've been, how duct tape my life is back together. No, no, he says you're valuable. He says you're love. He hung on that cross because he chose you. Y'all cheap, cheap sheep. No, sheep aren't cheap. Say that six times and neither are you. Come on, somebody. Because no one, I, I've learned this more than ever in our prison ministry. Mike Barber's here, the legend in prison ministry. Get up out from Mike Barber former Houston oil or two, my friend, but he has one of the greatest prison ministries, if not the greatest prison ministry in the United States and abroad. And I've learned through the compassion that we have continued to walk with as leaders. When you go into a prison setup or even what we do in the local streets and what we do in local missions or just your neighbor or that waiter or waitress or that Coworker, I've been preaching this for a while that you've never looked in the eyes of anyone that Jesus doesn't love. Sheep aren't cheap. He loves every 
single person. Some of you are like, even my mother-in-law? Yes. Her too. Especially her. Amen. God pursues what he loves. And I love how Jesus painted this picture of this incredible pursuit to go after the sheep. I had a friend. He's still my friend. Um, <laughs> sorry. I had this acquaintance. See if he's watching online. He's like, I thought we were friends. Uh, who his, his grandfather had passed away and uh, his grandma had passed away a few years before and he was really close to his grandpa and his grandpa told him, he said, hey, one day when I pass away, oh, grandpa, you're gonna live forever. He's like, no, I'm not. And one day when I pass away, I want you to have this watch. It's not worth a lot. It's not a Rolex. It's not a Breitling Bentley edition. This isn't anything crazy fancy. It's not diamond bezeled, but this watch I have worn for 35 years and it's kept time, and it's also kept me focused on getting home every day to my babies and grandbabies, and I want you to have it. He said, Grandpa, I want this watch. Thank you. He said, can't have it until I'm gone. So he passes away, and this, you know that one cousin who has no business being involved in any? Some of, some of that's personal for some of you. You're like, mm-hmm. I know who you're talking about. She got involved with all the jewelry and decided she was going to go pawn it all. And it wasn't even worth that much, but she was looking for a little extra cash. So she goes and pawns this, and he finds out about it. No, no, the watch? The watch was my grandpa's watch. He left it to me. Show me in writing where he left it to you. No, he did in word. Did you get it on video? If you didn't get it on video, it didn't happen. Like, what are we doing? So he goes, and he is now in crazy pursuit for something that's valuable to him. I mean, like, he could have went and just bought another watch, he could, have, he could have bought an eye watch. He could have bought any watch. But he is pursuing something that is valuable to him personally. Like this shepherd with the sheep, he left the 99 to go after Sheila, whatever that sheep was. I think that was the sheep's name. Like, Boys and girls, I got to leave and go find Sheila. <laughs> Sorry, this is the way I preach. If you're new to Hope City, this is the way I preach. Okay. So my friend goes to pawn shop after pawn shop. No, sir. No, sir. We don't know what you're talking about, sir. Absolutely not. Five, six, the seventh pawn shop. He walks in defeated. And this guy said, redhead, kind of spunky, brought a bunch of worthless jewelry in. He's like, my cousin. Ed says, it's literally my cousin. And he's like, yeah, I got that watch. Nobody wants this watch. And my friend grabs it. Tears coming down his face. He said, I want this. This watch is valuable to me. The guy said, you know what? I'm going to give it to you. That watch isn't worth much. He puts that watch on, still wears it to, to this day. He went to great lengths to recover something that was valuable. The shepherd wouldn't take the exhaustion. He wouldn't take the weariness or the discouragement of can't find him, can't find the sheep. My friend can't find the watch. The shepherd didn't give up because, well, I got 99 other ones and this one sheep is not my problem. No, no, he said... Y'all are carnal. Keep going. It's like I do an altar call at the end. I'll go, no, 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 bro. I'm going to sheep ain't one. Okay, that's an, it's ridiculous. What are we doing? Go, go, no, 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 problems. In. Okay. The shepherd had no quit in him. We can learn a lot from this shepherd. He had no quit in him. You know, Pastor Jackie and I, we're about celebrating 20 years of marriage next month. And you know, early on in our first three to four years, I mean, we had committed throwing the towel. Uh, uh, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe you should have married somebody else. No, we deleted all of that from our vocabulary. It was never going to be thrown in each other's face. That was never going to be a default that we go to. Well, maybe we should just throw in the towel. No, we decided early on, no, no, this is, we're growing old together. Like old together. Old, old together. Now, she, she doesn't age, so if you look at our wedding pictures, people are like, what is happening? Why are you aging like an American president? She still looks like a young Reba McIntyre. That's enough, but why? I want to know. You're being selfish with your skincare routine. Let me know about it. No, we're not going to throw in the towel. The shepherd didn't throw in the towel. I remember, and if you're new to Hope City, this will be a new story to you. If you've been in Hope City, uh, you've probably heard me tell this story, but I got the mic, so I'm going to say it again. Um, 
I remember when we went to the community pool in our neighborhood, and we don't typically go when it's like exceptionally busy, but this particular day was shockingly busy, and our kids were like, we want to swim, we want to go, and Jack's like, okay, let's divide and conquer, you take these kids, I'll take these kids, we're good. Y'all, it's wild, like, like people are playing music, there's like com- competition, whose speaker is louder than the other speaker, like people are grilling out, they're acting out, they're jumping in, there's pizza, you know, there's floaties in the pool, there's pizza floating not floaties, like a piece of pizza just floating. It's gross. Like, it's just not a good day. And so we're like, we'll just let the kids play in like the little kid play area. And Jackie looks at me and says, where's Daphne? Now, Daphne is our now eight-year-old as of two days ago. And it's wrecked my whole life. (laughs) Like, I'm not okay with it. But when Daphne was little, little, we're at the pool and she's like, where's Daphne? I was like, I thought Daphne was with you. And she's like, boy, Daphne was with you. So now we're panicked. We're looking everywhere. People are jumping in the water. I'm looking in the water. Like, why is this water so murky? And so I'm looking. We're looking everywhere. We can't find Daphne. We're yelling her name, but you can't hear us yelling Daphne over the speakers. We're yelling. We're yelling. And all the way at the end, about to jump in to the deep end, was all these kids jumping off the board. And here's little Daphne waddling towards the deep end. And y'all, I don't know how I blacked out. And I got really reckless. My friend Corey Asbury wrote a song called Reckless Love. And he got a lot of controversy for a season because people were like, my God's not reckless. Don't talk about my God like that. The only way I can describe me as a dad in that moment was reckless. I mean, y'all, I was, I was crossing people over, doing spin moves, knocking other kids in the pool. <laughs> Whatever it took. There was a guy laying out with like way too, I don't know if he had slathered himself up with butter. He was shining. I looked and I was like, I'm coming back to deal with you in a minute. So I run around him. I dip. I knock a kid in. I elbow this older lady and I'm like, I'm getting to Daphne. Nothing was going to get in my way. Nothing. I was reckless. It was a reckless love. I was not going to throw in the towel. I was not going to say, babe, babe, she's good. We got these other kids. That's crazy, right? <laughs> True story. None of this is exaggerated. I, 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 back in the day, you know, I used to you know, play a little basketball and stuff, and I could, I could kind of jump. Like the, you know, I, anyways, and I see this lady, and I'm deducing I can totally jump over her laying out and maybe her friend. Like I think I can clear them, but I was until I got tripped up by a pool floaty cord, and I tripped, and as I'm trying to jump over her, true story, my entire Chiquita banana-sized hand grabbed her face, her whole face, (laughs) and I steered from, true story, she's like, hey, I jumped, I was like, I'll be back, and true story, and as Daphne is falling in the deep end, I grab a hold of her little bathing suit, and her stomach touches the water, I pulled her up, she looks at me and smiles and says, hey, got me. I said, Daddy, I got you. And I'm walking back, and Jackie's looking at me, and the music is still playing. And I said, ma'am, my whole hand was on your face. (laughs) The whole thing. And she's like, I saw what happened. It was so beautiful. I was like, oh. Thanks. So I walked back, and and I'm apologizing to everybody for the trail of chaos. I hand Daphne, and I go back to Slick Rick, and I said, hey, sir. Can we talk about how olive oiled up you are, sir? Maybe it's time for you to go. Like, maybe it's time you've creeped out everybody at the pool. I'm not even sure those are shorts. Amen. Why are you telling us that? The shepherd had no quit in him. I had no quit in me. Why did the shepherd continue to pursue the sheep? Number two, write this one down. Because he had the fight to find. Oh, this is where our humanity gets messy. Because a lot of times we don't have the fight to find. We don't have the fight. I want peace, Pastor Daniel. Do you have the fight to find that peace in your life? By putting up the appropriate boundaries and borders? By turning off the noise of things that are robbing you of your peace? I want relationship with God. I want to go deeper in my relationship with God. Do you have the fight to find that Spend time, seek the Lord with all of your heart. I want community. Are you fighting for that type of community? Are you in a group? Are you leading a group? Come on, somebody. The fight to find. 
The shepherd's relentless search for this lost sheep highlights God's unwavering commitment to pursue and restore those who are lost. His search was thorough. His search was consistent. His search was persistent. And it was fully driven by love. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of fathering love who sees you because he had to, he had to fight to find an internal drive that refused to quit. Another story. This one's not funny. I have to say that because I said another story in the last service. They were like, <laughs> and I'm like, you're not going to laugh in a minute. This one's actually pretty serious. So about 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night, we get a knock on the door at our house. We're up in the Midwest. And my friend Troy is like startled and freaked out. Tears are in his eyes, but he wants to remain strong. I said, what's going on? What's going on? You can just tell. And he said, my, my son, my son got out. My son got out. It's 20 degrees outside. There's snow about two feet deep. We all don't know nothing about that. Yeah. Unless you go into the panhandle part of Texas or drive somewhere else. We don't think, praise God. Amen. We got the heat, but we don't have to deal with the, the sleet. Amen. So, so, so it's bad. It's really bad. And he said, my, my son got I said, slow down, slow down. He said, I don't know how long it's been maybe an hour. I don't know. Y'all the wind chill is like 11. He special needs. He got out. We can't find him. We're knocking on every neighbor's door. We need a search and rescue team. Let's go. Let's go. Come on, get dressed up. We got to go. And we're out there with sticks, sticking it in the snow, trying to find this little boy. I almost fell. Did y'all see that? I'm just kidding. I still got it. Amen. So you better watch it. Quit eyeing me. We're sticking this in the snow. Y'all, four hours has passed. We can't find him. We have fire department. The police are there. Troy could have said, hey, guys, we're good. Let's just call it a day. Hopefully my four-year-old son with special needs will turn up. No, no, no. He looked at all of us and rallied us at one point. He said, hey, y'all don't have quitting you, right? Y'all don't have quitting you, right? We're like, no. He's like, we're going to do this until we find him, right? We're like, Troy, look at this. We got you. It's like 11 of us out searching for this little boy. Six hours later, that little boy had found himself under somebody's boat and pulled the tarp around himself, and they found and rescued him. Come on, somebody. It was amazing. So watch this. I can't describe in words the joy and the overwhelming sense of gratitude on my friend Troy's face. I'll never forget it. It marked me then. It still marks me to tell the story now. It was a beautiful story of redemption and, and protection. And it reminds me of verse 5. When the shepherd found the lost sheep, it says this. And when he found it, he would joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When Troy wrapped up his little boy, he walked home and we all were like, praise God. And like fire department left and police officers were like, that should have, that could have, that would have ended in so much differently if we had never found that boy. The shepherd had no quit in him when he rescued and carried the sheep home. It showed that his pursuit, his pursuit was reckless and relentless and he didn't care how far the sheep had strayed. I'm going to find that sheep. And I need somebody to catch this today. No matter how far you have strayed, maybe somebody invited you today. They promised they were going to buy you a steak. <laughs> this is steak taco. Taco Bell. It's still kind of steak, right? It's like almost steak. But maybe you came in here today and you're like, I've strayed. I talked to a guy in between last service and he had his head down majority of the service and was, I thought, not listening. And he said, man, this whole, this whole message, man, I'm, I'm the sheep and I've strayed. And I didn't think that I was valuable or worth enough to ever come back in to a church again, but I'm, I'm honoring I'm honoring my mom by, by being here. And I said, man, sheep aren't cheap. And God has the fight to find you. And he's found you. And he still loves you. And he's not going to give up on you. And some of you would say, Pastor Daniel, I, I hear you. But I need you to hear me through this word today that God says you're worth fighting for. God says you're worth searching for. 
And just like my friend Troy, who said, y'all are going to quit on me, right? The Spirit of God has never quit on you. And Jesus is just one mention of his name away from refreshing and restoring and delivering and helping you. Why, why would he do this? Number three, write this one down or take a picture of it. Because people are his passion. You know what drives us in our Hope City missions, local, national, and global, is we're passionate about people. Yeah, because you're in ministry, right? Because you're clergy. That's what you all do. No, no, we're passionate about people because Jesus was passionate about people, and we're passionate about what Jesus was passionate about. So let me just brag on our Hope City worship team for a minute. If you were part of the crew that came and served for 11 straight days, make some noise. Come on, if you, if you showed up. And because people matter to God, they matter to us. And listen, we are going to shout from the rooftops and celebrate all God has done because restoration should bring celebration. Restoration and reaching those that are broken and hurting and in need. Oh yeah, that should bring some celebration. We're bragging on God's church, not what we've done. But I want to shout out Pastor Brandon, Pastor Kristen. Uh, I want to shout out Anthony and Michelle Minor, our entire missions team, for 11 days. But watch this. Because of your generosity, because of how you've sown, because of how you've shown up, because above your tithe and offering, you said, hey, I want to be a, a part of this disaster relief and I want to reach people. Wave at me if you were affected. Maybe you lost power for a minute. Come on. Oh, yeah, great. How many of y'all, you got your power back? Amen. Okay. If not, talk to Pastor Brandon in the lobby. But here's, where, here's the total impact for what God did in 11 days. Now, before we put it up, I need you to hear this. Uh, the, the mayor's office showed up. The chief of police showed up. The police academy came and served two days. Uh, there was a lot of rumors going around that Hope City was moving faster than the city was moving, reaching the city. Let's go, somebody. I'm bragging on God for a minute. That's amazing. So here's the total impact. 65,042 hot meals were given through your generosity. 1,514 of you showed up and served. That's amazing. 6,428 volunteer hours served. 641 people received prayer. And this one's wild. 710,000 pounds of essential items, water, and supplies were given out. This is what the church looks like. We didn't need credit. We gave God all the glory and all the honor because, again, the shepherd's joy in finding that lost sheep also reflects the joy in heaven over one sinner repenting. So when we would hand somebody a meal and they would see the compassion of Christ, listen, if you are just blowing through life and you don't see others, you're missing out on the greatest opportunity to walk in the assignment that God has for you. We're passionate about people because God is passionate about people. Whether it's a midweek chapel, whether it's an HC group, whether it's weekend experiences, everything that we're doing is to draw people closer to the, to the heart of God. It's Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It's the goodness and love of God that will draw somebody's heart to a place of freedom, whether it's through a meal, whether it's through compassion. We showed up to a assisted living home. I didn't talk about this in the last service. They had been without power for six days. Three floors, folks in their 70s, 80s, and even 90s. Come on, some of you are like, amen, I want to live that old. Some of you are like, not me, I don't need to go that long. No power, couldn't go up and down in the elevator. And we show up like the Hope City Army, and we start knocking on doors, and we're giving food and water and distribution and helping those far from God. So I, on behalf of Pastor Jackie and I and our entire leadership team, want to thank you for how you've served, how you've shown up, and how you've sown. Come on, somebody. Verse 6 says, when he arrives, he'll call together his friends and neighbors, saying, rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. This type of immense, immense joy is so necessary and needed. That's why, again, we're so passionate and we encourage our church to get involved and not just sit on the sidelines. Let me brag on you again. I'm bragging on y'all a lot today. Yeah. About to celebrate 10 years as a church in January, which is amazing. 10 years, it's phenomenal. But in nine years, we've given away close to $10 million to local, national, and global missions because of your generosity. Now, that number sounds like wild. Like, how? Because even if it's a widow's mite, well, how does my dollar help? Well, when 10, 12,000 of us give a dollar, it makes a difference. 
So thank you again because of that. We're able to literally go into the broken places of our city and continue to do what we do on the weekends while we're getting in the way of people's storms and pointing them to Jesus. Again, all of it is to help people find their way back to God, be discipled and grow in God. I talked to a lady in between services and she said, day three of no power, no water, all my stuff had gone bad. And I told my daughter, hey, let's get in the car. There's a church around the corner called Hope City, and uh, they're giving away food. And the daughter said, Mom, is it that bad? She said, baby, it's that bad. So they got in the car, and they came, and they got a meal. They got bottled water. They got some essential items. And the next day, their power came back on. And the daughter said to her, Mom, we should go back and serve alongside the people who served us. I mean, y'all, come on, hands and feet of Jesus. And so they showed back up and served for four consecutive days and told others, hey, we've been where you're at. Now, here's the truth. It's not a matter of if, it's when disaster strikes. We live in Houston, y'all, and we're believing for a, if y'all have weather faith, start putting it on the hurricane season. Amen. Y'all got weather faith. Come on, let's, let's believe God for a mellow season. And don't do like this one lady said, oh, I pray that it will never hit Houston. It'll go above and to the side of us. I'm like, so Lake Charles, like we got to no, just pray that it dissolves in the ocean. It can go anywhere else. Just not here. I'm like, no, no, ma'am. You don't pray. We'll pray. You stop praying. You don't pray. It's ridiculous. But thank you. Thank you for for showing up. It's, it's, it's proof that, that when God's church unifies together, there's nothing we can't accomplish. Sheep aren't cheap. People are valuable. You are valuable. He has the fight to find you. You're worth so much that he will be right there when you call on his, his name and he pursues what he loves. And because he pursues what he loves, we're reaching others. And because we're reaching others, we celebrate the restoration we have found and y'all, I can't keep it quiet. I tell everybody about Jesus. We had a tree fall yesterday. I asked the neighbor to come. I said, man, you got an extra chainsaw? And he said, yeah, yeah. I said, can, can, he said, I can come help. So he comes in and like, he's cutting this tree up. And, and she's like, babe, you're letting him do all the work. You should go help him. I'm like, hey, man, you're doing great. Like I was at, <laughs> super, like super kind. And so um, we're helping him. We're moving. Y'all, this is a true story. I jumped over the fence. She's like, baby, you need to get in and help him. I said, baby, he looks like G.I. Joe. I think he's fine. I think he's fine on his own. He doesn't need me. And it was, I jumped the fence and I jumped right down into a wasp's nest and the thing j- stings me on the calf. And I'm like, no, I'm, this is not for me. Amen. That's why we asked for help. Okay. Why are you telling us this story? Because within about 30 minutes of him being there, I said, hey man, you and your wife go, go to church anywhere. And then I asked this, are you, are you, are you, are you religious? Because I always ask that, and then when they're like, not really, I'm like, good, neither are we. Like, <laughs> but I can't help but talk about the freedom that we found, the love of Jesus that everybody has access to. That's a beautiful thing. I can't keep it quiet. Would you close your eyes just for a moment? God, this weekend, I said it a moment ago, but I, f- I pray that we fully embrace the worth and the value of each and every one of us in your eyes. I thank you for the fight. The fight to find. You didn't give up on my dad. You didn't give up on my grandpa at his last breaths. You didn't, you didn't give up on my uncles. You didn't give up on my family. We see people going from broken to breakthrough and from rejected to accepted on the daily. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you, God, that we get to be a part of the joyful mission of bringing others to you. God, again, I ask that we would all experience unanimously in agreement this weekend your unfailing, relentless love. That every single one of us would leave with the experience of seeing restoration not only in our own lives, but the domino effect of watching your grace and mercy heal someone else. Would you stand your feet? I left plenty of time on the clock on purpose because of this reason. And you won't have to fist fight anybody in the parking lot for the next service. Amen. I called Rodney last night or the night, the night before. And I I told him what I was preaching on. And he said, PD, how about this? I said, Pastor Daniel, what about this song? And 
I said, man, that entire moment is written out of the parable of the lost sheep. I love the bridge of this song, Reckless Love. It says this, it says, There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't lie you won't tear down, coming after me. To me, there's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Come on, can you lift your hands towards heaven? There's no shadow.
having the fight to find and that you love us and you pursue what you love with every eye closed just for a moment we always give two opportunities at the end of every hope city experience and these are the two opportunities here's the first invitation pastor daniel i don't know jesus is my savior but i'd like to I, I i've been caught up in some pretty messed up and messy situations but the reality is i need a savior that sheep aren't cheap. Yeah, I needed that because I haven't felt valuable. I haven't felt worth much. The Bible says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. All it takes is surrender. It's cost you no money. This gift is paid for in full by Jesus on the cross. Maybe the second invitation. Sheep aren't cheap. The fight to find God's passionate about his people. The truth is, Pastor Daniel, I've gotten caught up in the prodigal life and I have slipped away. And the truth is, I didn't realize that I'm worth fighting for. But today I felt the Holy Spirit. That's why I went to the anchor verse in John 14, 26, that the Holy Spirit would remind us of all the things that he has taught us. If you have fallen away, the word is in you. The word is in your heart. And the Holy Spirit is nudging your heart, pricking your heart, needling your heart today to say, hey, 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 hey. You can just call on his name once again and he will draw you back to his arms. And you can rededicate your life today, all over again, realign or reassign, reconnect to the assignment and realign your heart to his heart. So that's the two invitations and I'm gonna count to three. And if you're the first invitation, you wanna know Jesus as the first, for the very first time, or you're the second invitation, you wanna rededicate your life and you're grateful that he's never ran out on you and his reckless love has chased after you like I did, Daphne. One, I wanna give my life to Jesus. Two, I wanna rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. I see you and you and you and you and you and I see you and you and you and you and I see you and I see you back there. I see you over there. I saw you over here. I see you right here in the middle. I see you, my friend, right here. Come on, Hope City, hands are still going up. Come on, let's give God praise. I saw you back there. Beautiful. Come on, Katie Richmond, Woodlands, West Houston. If you're watching online, you can say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you. Additional seating, all of our watch parties, even in Tanzania. Can we all pray this prayer together? Say, Jesus, here's all my shame. Here's all my struggles. Here's all my trauma. Here's all my issues. Here's all my sin. I repent and ask you for your forgiveness. Jesus, thank you for hanging on that cross, swapping your life for mine so that I can live a life filled with hope, filled with freedom. From this moment on, I'm choosing to live for you. You're my Father. You're my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City. Come on, make some noise. It says that heaven rejoices when just one comes to know the Lord. Beautiful. Beautiful. 